certainly good to see all that are present here this morning. Uh, good to have those that are visiting with us uh, to let uh, especially the visitors know the uh, John Duvall, the man that works with us uh, uh, full time, has gone on vacation. I'm filling in for him while that he's gone. I'm presenting a lesson this morning and Lord willing also this evening. The scripture reading that we had a moment ago is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10 to verse 14. And I want us to look at that passage a little bit more in detail uh, in order for us to begin our lesson here this morning. I've titled uh, the lesson uh, Emmanuel, and uh, you'll see why as we uh, go through this text and through our lesson here this morning. I want to begin with just a little bit of background information uh, setting up what's going on here in Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, at this time, uh, Ahaz was king of Judah, and he wasn't a very godly king, which was true of a good bit of the kings at that time. Uh, in this particular time, he was threatened by Syria and Israel. Uh, those two nations were going to attack him. Isaiah the prophet was sent to King Ahaz to encourage him to trust in the Lord. Pick up the reading back in verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 7. In verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz. Now in verse 4, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Uh, the idea is be careful, be calm. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of Rezin, who was king of Syria, and the son of Remaliah, at that time was Pekah, uh, who was the king of Israel. Because Syria, Ephraim, uh, which is Israel, and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for your for ourselves and set a king over them. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, just a man. Within 65 years, Ephraim, is Israel, will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is Remaliah's son, which is Pekah, again, just a man. If you, if you, Ahab, will not believe, surely you shall not be established. The positive side of that is if he would believe, then he would be established and he would be delivered from this threat of these oppressing nations. Because when it comes to a contest between men and God, man is always going to come up short. To assure Ahaz that he had nothing to fear, from the two oppressing kings, God spoke then through the prophet Isaiah, verse 10, verse 11, more the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. The extent of God's offer was unlimited. Whatever Ahaz might ask as a sign that God would carry out his purpose, be it an earthquake or lightning, be it something sensational or simple, God would give it. But we see that the faithless king refused. Verse 12, Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will ask for this sign, nor will I test the Lord. Ahaz didn't want a sign because he didn't want to believe. His mind was already made up. Uh, Ahaz had either allied himself already with Assyria, the enemy of his nation, or he was planning to line up some military support from Assyria. We learn this from other uh, Old Testament passages. Either case, he was rejecting God. This expression of unbelief called forth an indignant retort from the prophet. Verse 13, And Isaiah said, Hear now, O house of, of David, is it a small thing for you to worry men, but will you also worry my God? King Ahaz represented the whole house of David, and through the house of David, the entire nation of Judah was involved. When Ahaz refused to ask for a sign, he involved not only himself, but also the destiny of those who would follow him on the throne. And with the Lord, Ahaz not only worried men and the prophet, passage, but he also grieved and offended God. I think it's worthy of note uh, that in verse 11, the prophet says to Ahaz, Your God. 
And then in verse 13, he changes it to my God, indicating that Isaiah could no longer speak of God as Ahaz, God. For the king had clearly rejected God. The matter was now taken out of the hand of Ahaz, for the prophet next addresses not the unbelieving king, but the house of David. The sign would now be given. Even though Ahaz didn't want a sign, a sign would be given. And now not just to... They has the king, but to the house of David and through it to the nation. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This prophecy of Isaiah 7 verse 14 was fulfilled some 700 years later in the birth of Jesus Christ. Whenever we take God up the account in Matthew chapter 1, uh, Joseph, uh, a just man, was about to put away he, he's eternal. the girl he's to whom he was betrothed. He's a complete uh, in the Jewish culture, being betrothed involved a very strong commitment. Uh, it was the next thing to marriage. In Isaiah 48, if you were going to break 12, a betrothal, it was like 13. a divorce. Listen to me, and Joseph, Joseph had discovered that Mary was with child, so he was I thinking about divorce. divorcing her. In verse 20, we and pick up the reading, While he thought the about these faith. things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God. With us. Jesus Christ is eternal God. As far as the record goes, uh, Jesus God never actually used this name, Abraham this name Emmanuel. And, and we don't find anyone in the four Gospels ever actually calling him by this name. It's really a description of who he is. And there are two principal truths that are wrapped up in this title, Emmanuel. Emmanuel brings together Jesus' deity and his humanity. And this morning we're going to examine the doctrinal truth of his deity, and then tonight we're going to focus on some practical truths of his humanity, uh, his concern with, his interaction with humanity that we derive from this title, Emmanuel. And hopefully we'll see how these two truths relate to us and relate to our needs, especially our spiritual needs today. First of all, Jesus is God. Jesus is deity. Emmanuel means, it's translated for us, we want to shout it out, Emmanuel means God with us. You'll find one word there are people in the religious world who tell us that, that Jesus is not God, is forever. that he was uh, simply a God and man or uh, a very godly teacher. Uh, some religious groups uh, teach that he was a created being. They teach he's Michael the Archangel. Going to last forever. In fact, Some contend that Jesus never used uh, or he had no attributes or powers of deity while he was on this earth. Uh, he was simply a man, ordinary man like you and me. It's claimed that he gave up his divine attributes and prerogatives whenever he left heaven. Some say he uh, is still simply a man now that he's back in heaven. And then there are some who don't believe this teaching, yet say it's not a major concern. Um, what difference does it make whether someone believes Jesus is only a man? What difference does it make uh, to believe that he didn't manifest any attributes or use any powers of deity while he's on this earth? We contend we shouldn't make an issue of this. Yet from the very beginning of the New Testament, Jesus is identified as God. Emmanuel means God with us. It does make a difference what we believe about Jesus, whether or not he revealed that he was God with all the powers and prerogatives of deity, or he was just a man. You know, if any mere man uh, called him Emmanuel, called himself Emmanuel, and, and told you that he was God, you'd think he was crazy, and rightly so. We further read but the New Hebrews Testament writers applied to Jesus Christ in this passage in Matthew 1, verse 23, the title Emmanuel, and said that it means God 
with us. And Jesus claimed to be God. And he did so at the risk of his own life. Now look at John in chapter 10. In John in chapter 10 and verse uh, 30 through verse 33, uh, Jesus made a statement before the Jews. He said, I and my Father are one. And the Jews, they took up stones to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews, uh, they acknowledge the Father in heaven to be God. And they understood here by Jesus' statement, I and my Father are one, that Jesus was claiming to be God. Jesus was claiming to be equal on a par with the one they referred to as the Father in heaven, the one that they acknowledged was God. You know, so close was Jesus' identification with God that it was, it was natural for him to equate a man's attitude to himself with his attitude to God, thus to know him was to know God. John 8 and verse 19. Uh, the Pharisees said to Jesus, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you'd known me, you would have known my father also. You claim to know the father. You acknowledge him as God. Uh, if you'd known me, you would have known my father also. Because he's claiming, Jesus is claiming that he himself is deity, just like his father is deity. To see Jesus was to see God. In John, in chapter 12, and verse uh, 45, in John, chapter 12, and verse 45, uh, Jesus says, He who sees me sees him who sent me. He said several times, His Father in heaven that sent him. He who sees me sees God. To believe in Jesus was to believe in God. In John, in chapter 14, and verse 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. Believe in me as being on a par with the God that you acknowledged, that you acknowledge in heaven. To hate Jesus was to hate God. In John chapter 15 and verse 23, Jesus said, He who hates me hates my Father also. And the Jews, they wouldn't think about hating their Father. He's God. Jesus says, he who hates me, which is hates my father also. Or are you building to honor Jesus was to honor God. In John in chapter 5 and verse 23, uh, Jesus says, all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, this is why the, the Jews wanted Pilate to crucify him. In John, in chapter 19, <coughs> in verse 7, the Jews answered Pilate, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. The Jewish people had no problem understanding what Jesus was talking about when he claimed to be the Son of God. Of God. Jesus claimed of the to be God. Well, the of and they the wanted him crucified because they thought that he was Jesus guilty of blasphemy, Christ speaking against God when he equated he himself with God. And more than that, John, we look further. One, Jesus John received worship two. as God. John begins his if you in the beginning was worship any word. creature, any created person or thing, God. that's and idolatry. It's commanded in Matthew, 10, Matthew 4 and verse 10, Jesus said, quoting Old Testament passage, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Accepting worship is a prerogative of deity. We find that the infant Jesus was worshipped by the wise men. In Matthew in chapter 2 and verse 1 and verse 2, 
word. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When they come to him, in verse 11, and when they come to the house, they saw the young child of Mary's mother, they fell down and worshiped him. And when they'd opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh were typical gifts that were brought uh, in service, to, brought before God in service to God in Old Testament times. They're worshiping Him as deity, as God. When Jesus walked on the water and calmed the great storm, the disciples bowed down and worshiped Him. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 33 records it. The blind man whom Jesus healed worshiped Him. John in chapter 9 and verse 35 through verse 38, previous this time, Jesus had healed this blind man. The blind man uh, had been brought before the scribes and Pharisees in the synagogue to testify with respect to what had happened. And he wouldn't deny that it was Jesus that did it. Uh, he wouldn't deny that it was a miracle that took place. And they cast him out of the synagogue. Uh, in John chapter 9, verse 35, uh, Jesus heard that they, the Pharisees, had cast him out. And when he, when Jesus had found him, he sent to him. Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You've both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. There are many other incidents we look at we have on record where Jesus was worshipped. You know, in contrast to this, when... Cornelius fell down at the feet of Peter and worshipped him. Peter raised him up saying, Stand up. I myself am also a man. I'm just a man. An ordinary man. I'm not someone who ought to be worshipped. You should, should only worship God. Worship deity. When the people of Lystra began to worship Paul and Barnabas, thinking they were gods in the likeness of men, Paul and Barnabas said, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. We should be worshiping only God, not worshiping us who are just men. But at no time did Jesus ever refuse to be worshipped. Jesus accepted and approved of those who worshipped him. And the reason why is because he was more than a mere man. He knew that he was God, he was deity. So we see he claimed to be God, and we see that he received worship <clears throat> as God. Also, a, a number of times in the New Testament, Jesus is specifically called God. In Romans, in chapter 9, verse 5, the Apostle Paul, he describes the nation of Israel and the blessings which came from the nation, and here Jesus is called God, Christ the eternally blessed God. Paul in Titus, in chapter 2, and verse 13, speaks of our look toward the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, is God. But you'll learn much There's many more statements uh, just like these that we've cited. The New Testament letters contain the testimony of three apostles, Paul, Peter, and John, all bearing witness that our Lord Jesus Christ is God. And then added to their testimony, we read what God the Father says to God the Son in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. God the Father said to the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God the Father calls His Son God. And we call man man because he possesses the characteristics, uh, attributes, and, and powers of humanity. Jesus Christ. The New Testament writers called Jesus God because he possessed and displayed the characteristics, attributes, powers, and prerogatives of deity. A final proof that Jesus is God, they're going to note, is seeing the fact 
that Jesus forgives sins as God. Lord, show us the Father. On two separate occasions, it's stated that Jesus forgave sinners. The first time, it's recorded Mark chapter 2, uh, first 11 verses. A paralytic on this occasion was brought to Jesus by his friends and let down uh, on his bed through the roof. Jesus saw that his need was basically spiritual. And he surprised the crowd by saying, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Mark 2 and verse 5. And then to show that he had the power on earth to forgive sins, Jesus healed the paralytic. The second declaration of forgiveness was made to a woman known to be immoral. Luke records this in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to verse 50. On that occasion, Jesus was taking a meal in a Pharisee's house when this woman came behind him as he reclined the table. And she washed his feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. She kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. On both occasions, the bystanders ask, Who is this who even forgives sins? Why does this man... Well, the Speak blasphemies like this. Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus you think about it, their questions God were correctly worded. Saying, I am uh, we may forgive the injuries which I others do to us. Someone sins against us, we can uh, forgive Jesus them. And take God necessarily forgive them, although if they sin against us, it's likely they sin against God also, and they need to forgive us from God. The point is, though, is that we may forgive the injuries which others do to us, but the sins we committed against God, only God himself can forgive. Since no one but God can forgive sins, and Jesus forgave sins, therefore he is God. This great truth makes a difference to me. When it comes to the matter of my sins being forgiven, I want the assurance of God. Uh, that, Jesus that I have forgiveness. Over all things, and in him all if Jesus was a mere man when he went around forgiving sins, based upon experiences with ordinary men, he didn't provide much assurance of forgiveness of sins. Ordinary men sometimes have a problem forgiving sins. Uh, this is why we find time and time again uh, Jesus talking about man's need to forgive other men as he is against him and even forgive giving them as God forgives man. Jesus talked about it quite often. Because Jesus knows that ordinary men sometimes have a problem. They're lax in forgiving others. You know, some say they forgive, but it's clear they don't. Some say, I'll forgive you, but I can't forget. And they don't forget. They continue holding grudge. They continue to bring that sin back up and throw it in your face, even though they claim that they have forgiven you sins. That's what ordinary men do sometimes. So if Jesus is an ordinary man, just a man, when he's forgiving sins, that's not much assurance. He gives us sins. With God, when he forgives, he forgets. Hebrews in chapter 8 and verse 12. Their sins are lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That means that God will never bring up our sin against us again. Once he forgives us of our sins. Colossians chapter 2 and verse Jesus Christ is God. Trust him. Worship him. Look to him for forgiveness of sins. Give your very best to him. If someone says, yet it doesn't make any difference really whether or not I believe Jesus is God, look at John 8 and verse 24. John 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, Except a man believe that I am, he will die in his sins. Jesus is affirming to be the I am of Old Testament writing. He's affirming to be deity. He's affirming to be God. And Jesus himself said, Except a man believe that I am, that I am God, he will die in his sins. It's a great doctrinal truth revealed in the New Testament that Jesus is God. How can we make practical application of that? Well, I'm saving that for a lesson here uh, this evening. We're going to note in our lesson this evening several very practical ways that we find 
in the New Testament that Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is God with just spell uh, it out to me. I'm the but for now, I'm rest assured that you can situation. have I'm forgiveness for from the God of heaven. Need. You don't have to die in your well, sins. That's what the grace of God's about. You can go away from this place this morning having forgiveness of your sins. Before. Believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Be Believing Him for what He claimed to be, the God of heaven Himself. Bad circumstances. You may repent of your day. sins. Jesus commanded we be must repent of our sins. Be baptized for the mission of those sins. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Apostle Peter telling people who realized they were guilty of sin, told them they need to repent. Be baptized, every, name, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of their sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Seeing you can have, have forgiveness priest, of your sins the heavens, from Jesus the very Son God of heaven by obeying, obeying Him. For we do not have a if you're a child of God, you realize you're guilty of sin one way or another, you don't have to die in those sins. You can have forgiveness of those sins from the God of heaven. If we'll repent of what we're doing, if we'll confess those sins before God, pray to Him for forgiveness, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we can help someone this morning taking care of the problem they might have in their life of sin, Come forward, make your desire and own serve God as they stand in sight. This designation is four times in the book of Revelation. We've looked at three. Here's the fourth one. Revelation 21 and verse 6 and verse 7. Uh, Jesus, God, said to John, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. Nothing will be lacking in the complete fullness and realization of all spiritual desires of the glorified soul in heaven. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. The Alpha and the Omega, the all-sufficient Christ, is the one that makes that affirmation with respect to his people in that eternal home. There's a fourth lesson to be learned from this name. The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, not only speaks of Jesus' eternal nature and his work of revelation and his sufficiency, but it also speaks of his victory. Here in Revelation 22, our opening text, verse 12 and verse 13, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Whatever Jesus starts, he finishes. Uh, I have my files and on my desk work that I've started and never finished. I have books that I've begun to read but never completed. Uh, and if you're like most people, there are probably a few things that you've started but never finished. Jesus Christ finishes everything that he starts. That's part of this affirmation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The book of Revelation reveals this to us. In Genesis, we read of the creation of the heavens and the earth, the beginning. Revelation speaks of the new heavens and the earth, new earth, the end. Christ ushering the new heaven, new earth in. Genesis speaks of Satan's attack on God's creation, the beginning of Satan's attack on God's creation when man fell into sin. The book of Revelation tells how Satan will be judged forever, speaks of the end of what's going to happen to Satan. The book of Revelation is the completion of the book of Genesis in this sense. Genesis reveals God's promises of man's redemption. Revelation depicts redeemed saints reigning victoriously with Christ through all eternity. What God starts, He finishes. A scheme of redemption and its revelation originate and terminate with God. Now, application to us, what God starts in our lives, what Jesus starts in our lives, he will finish. You know, sometimes it looks as though God's not going to make it or that his plans will not work out. But he is going to make it. His plans will indeed be accomplished. And that's the overall theme of the book of Revelation. God's saints will be victorious 
because Christ is victorious. At the time that the book of Revelation was being written, it didn't look like God's saints would be victorious. It didn't look like God's plans would be accomplished. In fact, it looked like Satan and his cohorts were winning and were going to win. The spiritual battle was going on. False teaching was rampant and deceiving many. Immorality was on the increase and adversely affecting God's people. Christians everywhere were being persecuted by the Roman government. Revelation was written so that God's people might be encouraged. The overall message is that they would remain faithful and be faithful on God's side, they'd be assured that they were on the winning side. Ultimately, God would be victorious. That same message of revelation for them back then is for us today. It's for us to be encouraged today. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. And if you begin with him at Alpha, you will end with him at Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. What he starts, he finishes victoriously. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and verse 2. And the writer says, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author, that's the Alpha, and the finisher, that's the Omega, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In Philippians 1, verse 6, Apostle Paul, very confident, he says, of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What he starts, he will finish, finish victoriously. The Alpha and the Omega should remind us of the eternal nature of Christ, should remind us of his work of revelation, his sufficiency, and also his victory. Let's be encouraged today, for he is the Alpha and Omega, and he's our Savior. One day the reward that's with him will be given to his faithful saints. Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus says, Be faithful to death, and I will give you the crown of life. In the context of Jesus' affirmation to be the Alpha and Omega, John was told to write, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter to the gates into the city. This is how you and I stay on the winning side. Stay on the side of victory with Jesus Christ. It's by doing his commandments. Have you done his commandments? Are you obeying his commandments? Jesus commands in John chapter 14, verse 1, You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus commands in Luke 13, verse 3, Repent or perish. Change the way you're living against God's will and now walk in accordance with God's will or perish. Jesus commands that we confess him before men. If we do that, he'll confess us before his Father in heaven. Jesus sent his apostles and all the world to make disciples. They'd make disciples by baptizing them in the name of, by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus sent his apostles out to command those that were becoming disciples to remain disciples by observing all things that Jesus has commanded. Are you doing that? Can we assist you in obeying his command some way this morning as it applies to you? If so, come forward and make it that desire known to us as we stand and sing this song.